Hello, welcome to our fourth vlog on finished work eschatology. I'm going to, as we go, kind of dispense of the intros and formalities and not go do a lot of backdrop or a lot of context from where we came because I think if you're at vlog four, you've probably went through one through three. If you haven't, I encourage you to do so. Uh, so we'll just try to move forward as, as quickly as we can. This is subtitled, Not One Stone Left Upon Another, and you're going to find out why in a moment as we finally make our debut in Matthew 24. Now, I want to give you some Bible study notes. If you are interested, and I think we all should be to some extent because we want to see the full picture, if you are interested in the parallel passages from for some of the things we're going to be reading from Matthew 24, then you might want to jot these down and go study them from the other Gospels. And by parallel passage, I mean a passage that lines up with what's being said in Matthew 24 but it will be in a different chapter and verse in a different book. And those parallel passages, one from Mark, three from Luke, here they are. Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 33. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. And Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 36. I highly encourage you to read those. Let's read the first two verses of Matthew chapter 24. And we'll remind you that Jesus has just given his famous Jerusalem, O Jerusalem speech at the end of 23. And he says, your house is left to you desolate. That's fresh on the minds of his audience. When in chapter 24, verse 1, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, verse 2, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. I want to begin by saying that history tells us that in AD 70, the Roman general Titus ordered the stones of the foundation of Jerusalem to be pulled up whenever he and his invading army had ransacked Jerusalem. So there would be a pulling up of the foundational stones uh, that would happen less than 40 years from the time that Jesus makes this prophecy. Now, that could speak to Matthew 23, 36, just a few verses earlier. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And it speaks to Matthew 23, 38, your house is left to you desolate. Now, where we get a fulfillment of prophecy, because I think it's important as we go, we're going to do this probably every vlog, is show you what a Jewish audience would have thought about these statements based upon their scriptures. And you know that their scriptures were what we call the Old Testament. Their Torah was Matthew through Deuteronomy, or Matthew, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then they had the writings, and those writings would have been the major and minor prophets. The book of Micah, chapter 3, listen to verses 9 through 12, and follow along if you have your Bible. But truly, I'm sorry, verse 9. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity. The word pervert in the Hebrew there is twist. You, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and they say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come to us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins. And the mountain of the temple, like the bare hills of the forest. Now that is from Micah chapter 3, a prophecy about due to the nature of the leadership, the temple was actually going to be, and let's say, read it again, the, the city is going to be plowed like a field, become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. So. Micah actually prophesied that the whole thing's coming down. So when Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 2, says, 
Do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Why does Jesus ask, do you not see all these things? They can't see these things, but they can see these things through two eyes. The eye of Old Testament scripture and the eye of New Testament spirit-led revelation. And he's transitioning them from merely seeing it in Micah 3 to seeing it in reality, and he even gave them the timing by saying, in, and I'm repeating myself, Matthew 23, 36, all these things will come upon this generation, not 2015, but the audience in which Jesus is speaking. So that's a fulfilled prophecy. Now, I want to emphasize our subtitle, which is not one stone left upon another, and I, it's a great moment to do something that is crucial in studying not only eschatology, but in studying the Bible in general, and that is that fine line between believing the reality of what you're reading and believing that it literally means every word that it says. There are a lot of metaphorical things in the Bible. When the, when the book of Psalms says, our father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, my question is, what about the 1,001st or the 1,002nd hill? Well, every Bible student would go, well, that's not, he doesn't literally only own them on a thousand hills. It means he owns them on all the hills. You're exactly right. It doesn't mean he owns them only on a thousand hills because the number 1,000 has greater implications to a Hebrew. You'll need to remember that when you get to the book of Revelation. Um, so this is one of our first examples of a non-literal language being used in our study whenever Jesus says not one stone will be left upon another we do not take that to mean every single stone of the temple will be completely taken off because the wailing wall still stands in Jerusalem which is a part of Herod's temple but what we do know is that the stones were removed, and I'll talk about that in just a moment a little more, uh, under that invasion of General Titus. Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 24. Now, to give you a bit of context for this passage, in Matthew 27, Jesus is on his way to the cross, and he's faced Pontius Pilate. Pilate brings him in front of the crowd, and assumes that he can get out of this very tough spot. Pilate doesn't want to crucify Jesus. He actually likes him. He doesn't want to go through with it, but he doesn't want to appear weak. And he's had a lot of political issues in the last few years with the Jews. And he's a little bit on edge with his own leaders in Rome. So uh, he needs to appease the crowd. So he offers them a choice. He thinks it's pretty easy. There's a murderer named Barabbas, or there's this guy named Jesus, who I don't think has really done anything wrong, Pilate says. Which one do you guys want? And I think he says it with a smile on his face, like, this is simple. They're not going to want a murderer. And they do. They choose Barabbas. And listen to verses 24 and 25 of Matthew 27. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, or an uproar, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Boom. Jesus said in Matthew 23, four chapters earlier, this generation is going to see this stuff come upon it. And at the cross, the crowd literally pulls the prophecy into themselves and says, let His blood be on us and on our children. Now when the Bible wants to go past that, the Old Testament is replete with examples of upon your children and your children's children, which would mean multiple generations. And sometimes the Bible even goes further and says, unto your children and your children's children, unto the tenth generation. But if it just says us and our children, we're talking about a generation. We're talking about us and our family, not us and the family of our religion a couple thousand years down the road. So the blood that was upon their hands is the blood that's being shed right in front of their face. Now, I want to answer a question that came in a few weeks ago that I, I didn't really address too much at the time because it was a little ahead of ourselves. 
but it seems appropriate. Now, someone wrote and asked, and by the way, I encourage you to ask. We'll, we'll get to them if we can. Uh, someone emailed and, and asked, and they were believing along these lines and, and, and going along with us in these, this study. And they said, but what I see is a lot of opposition when I bring up historians. So if I quote Josephus, they said a lot of dispensational uh, people will argue with me and say, well, that's not even in the Bible. You're building your entire philosophy of end time events off of history instead of Bible, which is actually not true. The converse statement could be that a dispensational is building their entire prophecy off of Fox News, CNN, and the newspapers and the internet instead of the Bible because the Bible seems pretty clear on the timing of these events. Um, but they asked me, is it okay to bring up a historian like Josephus? So what I want to do is answer that this way by giving you a, a little bit of reference. Um, they A lot don't think you can use people like Josephus because they're not in the canon of Scripture. But to me, that's like saying that you're not allowed to understand World War II by reading a history book. Um, you have to talk to people that lived it. Well, it helps to talk to people that lived it, but how are you going to understand it now if you don't read a history book? So what we have in a writer like Josephus, he's not in the canon of Scripture. He's not writing Bible. In fact, he's not even a Christian. Let me give you a little bit of his biography. He's born Joseph ben Matiyahu in AD 37, which means he is born just a few years after Jesus dies outside of Jerusalem, the man that we'll know as uh, Josephus Flavius. Flavius Josephus will not be born until a few years later in the same city. He's born in Jerusalem. His father is of priestly descent, and his mother was actually a descendant of royalty. He went into the military. He fought against the Romans in Galilee at the early days of the Jewish rebellion against the Roman Empire, and he was captured in Galilee in AD 67, taken as a slave. He became an interpreter for General Vespasian, and when Vespasian becomes emperor in AD 69, he gives Josephus his freedom, and Josephus in exchange actually applies and receives, uh, applies for and receives Roman citizenship and then serves Vespasian's son, Titus, who becomes the general as Vespasian goes to Rome to rule the Romans. Titus then takes his army and turns it against Jerusalem, and his, in, his interpreter and ser body servant, so to speak, is Josephus. Uh, in, after the, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 75, Josephus writes down uh, what we know as a book called The Jewish War, and that recounts the history of the revolt of Jew, uh, Israel against Rome from the period of AD 66 to AD 70. So uh, it's important to note a couple of things. He's not writing as a Christian. He's writing as a Roman citizen of Jewish descent. So he's not trying to fulfill prophecy. Uh, he's not trying to, he doesn't, he's probably never even read the writings of the what we would call the New Testament, which many of them by the time he writes are done, finished being written. Um, so, so when we talk about him, we're talking about an eyewitness to events. Now why I find that crucial is because we have a man who literally wrote about events he lived through and he wrote about them five years after they happened. So we're talking about a very fresh perspective on history. And the amazing thing is while Josephus is not trying to fulfill prophecy because he doesn't even know the prophecy, he's not writing from a pro-Jesus perspective, so he's not trying to uphold Christianity. Uh, he's simply writing an account of events that's probably tilted towards Rome and a little bit away from Judaism, granted. That eyewitness account ends up lining up so much with prophecy that you have to use it as a part of the historical record because to not use it is to not be true to the process. It's to ignore an eyewitness account. So I'm going to, to do a little bit of reading just for a moment from the writings of Josephus, particularly what I'll read from is volume one of the works of Flavius Josephus. And uh, his first volume, they, that was a compiled volume, um, two or three volumes, page 473. Listen to this in regards to the stones being pulled off. Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and temple, but should leave as many of the towers standing as were of the greatest eminency. Skipping down. 
And so much of the wall as enclosed the city on the west side, this wall was spared in order to afford a camp for such as were to lie in garrison, as were the towers also spared in order to demonstrate to posterity what kind of city it was and how well fortified which the Roman valor had subdued. But for all the rest of the wall, it was so thoroughly laid even with the ground by those that dug it up to the foundation that there was nothing there was nothing left to make those that came thither believe it had ever been inhabited. This is written five years after the fall of Jerusalem about the temple. It actually takes Jerusalem almost 200 years to recover. The Romans do such damage. There's nearly two centuries for them to really build back up. Uh, I also want to read in regards to the same thing from a British theologian by the name of F.F. F. Bruce. For those of you who have, have read any of Bruce's work, you might recognize this. Um, he, he writes this, Accordingly, in April of A.D. 70, Titus invaded Jerusalem. As the siege wore on, the horrors of famine and even cannibalism were added to the hazards of war. But the defenders had no thought of capitulating, least of all when Titus, using Josephus as his interpreter, urged the advantages of timely surrender upon them. On July 24th, the Romans captured the fortress of Antonia. Twelve days later, the daily sacrifice in the temple was discontinued. And on August 27, AD 70, the temple gates were burnt. Two days later, on the anniversary of the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians in 587 BC, the sanctuary itself was set on fire and it was destroyed. By September 26, AD 70, the whole city was in Titus' hands. It was razed to the ground. Only three towers of Herod's palace on the western wall were left standing with part of the western wall itself. Now, in closing for today, I got about three minutes or so. I want I wanted to give you a quick review of the three temples, the t three temple structures of Israel. And then next week we get into the trifold question asked by the disciples. We'll, we'll, we'll glance at that before we go. There were three temples in Israel's history. Now we're excluding the tabernacles that were not considered permanent structures. Most Christians are familiar with Solomon's temple. We've been led to believe that Solomon's temple was the most glorious of the three. Not true. We'll see in a second. Solomon builds his temple in the 10th century BC. It lasts until about 586, 587 BC when it is destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They completely eradicate it, steal its goods, and knock it down. Most of us know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, about 70 years later, in 516 BC, uh, the Zerubbabel's temple is rebuilt. Most of your minor prophet books rotate around the rebuilding of that temple, books like Nehemiah and Ezra. They rebuild the temple called Zerubbabel's temple, and it lasts until 168 BC when it is destroyed by Syrian invader Antiochus Epiphanes, who sacrifices a sow on the altar. The abomination, the original abomination of desolation happens in the temple as he sacrifices a pig uh, in mockery of Judaism. Uh, and that will be down for over a hundred years. And then about 15 years before Christ, uh, 15 to 20 years before Christ, Herod begins to build a temple under Roman supervision in the city of Jerusalem that will become the greatest temple of the three. Herod's temple will not be completed until AD 64, uh, a tragedy because less than six years later it falls at the hands of the Romans. Uh, he will uh, employ over 10,000 workers and the project will be an ongoing thing that lasts throughout his lifetime spectacular edifice, red and white, staggered marble, almost look like a checkerboard. Um, the waves of the ocean embedded into the concrete, uh, or into the, mold, the, uh, the mortar, and sprinkled with gold. And so when the sun came up, it would splash on the side of the temple, and, the, and you would see it sparkle. The Roman soldiers would scrape that to, to get the gold shavings off when they knocked the temple down in AD 70. So that's just a little bit of brief history about those temples. Um, we're going to stop there because I'm really trying to stay on a time frame with this. I think a lot of people will, will watch and follow along if we keep them short. And I don't want to cram too much info in either. So next week, where we're going to move on to is Jesus going to the Mount of Olives and speaking to his disciples privately. 
and they will ask a, a triple question. Uh, and I don't think it's just three questions. I think it's one question with three uh, sort of paracotes, three sub paracotes rather. Um, we'll get into that next week. Uh, hope you have a great week. God bless you. Hope you've enjoyed.